Ah, no, quite a number. Roberta. Ah, I've got, uh, I'm seeing, yeah, on my screen, actually. I only see a part of it because I have to scroll. Irene, me sent you. She say, are you there? Irene has not. her microphone. Uh -huh. Maybe she has some problems. No, it's actually not bad. Now we are eight people. Okay. With four minutes to go. Yeah. This is my very last job before I go on holiday. Oh, great. I'm on holiday. Yeah. As soon as I switch off my Zoom meeting, I'm on holiday. Uh, I, all, I, I have had somewhat difficulties to make holiday this year. So I will, I, I, I'm in a very complicated state in the sense that I do holiday. Uh, I, I am on holiday, but one day holiday, one day work. No. This is not a good solution. No, I decided I was very tired and needed to stop for a while. Absolutely. Minutes and then we start, if okay. that's okay with you. That's good okay. with me. Yep. Start. Uh, we have, a, first I would like to welcome everybody. I'm very happy that we have 12 attendants, uh, at least 12 now. Maybe we will be more, but this is, I think, uh, this speaks for the title of the talk and for the speaker that even in, in this vacation time, even in this high summer, Richard could attract so many people. So this, I think, is already uh, quite a success. It's my high pleasure to introduce, my high pleasure and honor to introduce Richard Walker. Richard Walker, uh, how to describe him? Well, usually one starts by telling what people, what people have studied and uh, actually Richard is an economist by training. But Richard is one of the rare breed of scientists with whom you can raise, I think, almost every topic and he has something intelligent to say about it. Uh, I have the high pleasure uh, to call to be called a friend of him and I call him a friend, a close friend I have to say or I, I, I have the pleasure to say and uh, I have had various opportunities to discuss with him 
at my home place with a bottle of whiskey. Uh, and I can tell you, this man is really great in whatever he talks about. And being his friend is an intellectual pleasure, but as I can tell you, also a culinary one. Uh, not to mention that he is a big singer. Unfortunately, I haven't had the pleasure to uh, attend one of his concerts, but uh, also this is one of his domains. Professionally, he um, has, uh, let's say, an interesting career. He worked for Telecom Italia. That's where I met him uh, during the PACE project. That was the starting project or the first project of the European Center for Living Technology. Then uh, later on, uh, he was involved, and I think in a quite pivotal role at the Blue Brain project. Um, and he is still there. Uh, now in a little bit different position, he is officially retired, but nevertheless, man, he is one of these type of people who don't stop working. So he is now uh, involved in allocating computer time for COVID research. Um, Richard brings together knowledge from various fields of expertise, from the humanities, but also from the, from the natural sciences. And I think this is one of the explanations why I think that he can make really interesting comp contribution to what I would like to call model-based and, so to speak, analytical anthropology. Uh, you see that he has chosen a very timely topic for various reasons, very timely. I know that he started this type of research a number, a couple of years ago, but uh, for also unfortunate reasons, I think that there is no better time to speak about epidemiology. So uh, at least now we will enjoy a nice talk about the epidemiology, the epidemiolo epidemiology of rock art. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Rudy. Uh, as Rudy said, I, we first got to know each other when I first got to know the ECLT in your first ever project, which was called PACE, which was some programming artificial cells through evolution. We're still thinking about that for some time in the future, but it was a nice idea. Um, that was way back in 2005 when I was working in Italy. Then in 2010, I moved to Switzerland to join the Blue Brain team. I stayed there till I retired in 2018. And my boss, Henry Markram, uh, gave me a lot of time to follow my own scientific projects. Now, ever since I was a kid, I was interested in what I called, what, in things which were, to use my own words, big and complicated. I think today that's called complexity science. And uh, nothing really, is quite so big and complicated as human culture, the huge diversity of human culture throughout the world. And for many, many years, I've been interested in trying to understand why human culture is what it is and why humans are so different from other animals. So, you know, if a Martian came down to earth tomorrow morning, you'd see this difference straight away, or she, she, she would see this difference straight away. Humans, unlike other animals, have massive cultural productivity. We've developed several thousand languages. We've developed myths, religions, science, literature, poetry. And no other species has this sort of volume or variety of cultural production that we do. Also, we've done this incredibly fast. Most of the things you think about as human cultural achievements, you could start with agriculture, or you could think about cities, or you could think about the Industrial Revolution, are really, really recent. Human Homo sapiens has been on the planet for about 380,000 years, is our best estimate today. Uh, but agriculture, we didn't get any until about 12,000 years ago. And as for industry, it's all developed in the last 300 years. Now that's incredibly fast. No animal that we've ever heard of develops anything remotely at that speed. Finally, humans have an enormous ecological range. You can find humans in the Arctic. You can find 
humans in the Kalahari Desert. You can even find humans in New York. So just about any niche, however difficult, humans have managed to occupy it. So, that, so for years and years and years, that's really puzzled me. And I was sort of thinking, why is it that humans are so exceptional? Now, the majority of scientists and non-scientists will probably say, well, it's obvious. It's the human brain. Uh, the human brain is three times bigger than that of any other primate, though it's smaller than that of a whale or an elephant. Uh, it certainly gives us abilities that are vastly superior to those of other, other animals. For instance, language. For instance, the ability to make tools, complex tools, the ability to certain kinds of abstract thought and planning, the ability to learn from our, our peers and our superiors. But when I think about this, I don't think it's a very satisfactory explanation. So if it was just the brain, why didn't other apes do the same thing? Seven million years ago, we had our last common ancestor. Why did only humans develop in this peculiar direction? And also, the timing of our development doesn't really match what we see in the, in the archaeological and the historical record. Almost certainly there's been no big changes in human neurobiology for the last 100,000 years, and maybe not for the last 400,000 years. And yet in the same period, uh, humans have changed immensely. So if there's no biological change, but immense cultural change, that change can't be due to biology and it can't be due to, due, due to genetics. So that raises the question, what did drive it? And um, over the last few years, a consensus has emerged. Uh, nearly everyone agrees that the key factor is culture and what's been called cumulative cultural evolution. All animals evolved genetically to adapt to their environment. And all animals learn individually during their lifetimes. A few even copy from each other. For instance, we know that chimpanzee mothers teach their infants how to use tools. But humans do much, much more than that. They learn systematically from their ancestors. And that means the my father's innovation becomes a building block which I can, I can use as a basis to make further innovations. So he makes an ax, I can then cut wood and I can use the wood to build houses or whatever. And this gives us an incredibly efficient, powerful uh, adaptation machine. We don't have to wait for Darwinian evolution to adapt our genes to new environments. Our cultures can evolve solutions, adaptive solutions, much faster than, than animals who, that rely on individual learning or on genetics. And when we have miracles like human language, this is a result of this cultural evolution. Languages evolve. Now, so far, this is more or less uncontroversial. I think you're going to find very few anthropologists who will disagree. But the questions I raised earlier remain. If cultural evolution can be so fast, well then why are some of the most important human achievements so recent? If we had Homo sapiens in Morocco 380,000 years ago, why do we get agriculture only 12,000 years ago and not, let's say, 360,000 years ago? And why did only humans go in, in this direction when other primates with the same starting material absolutely did not? So even when we take account of cultural evolution, we still have questions about why it's only ours and about the timing. How can we answer those questions? Now, in the early 2000s, there was what's been called the demographic turn in anthropology, which is a minority tendency, but it's an important one. 
some archaeologists and anthropologists began to propose models suggesting that everything depended on demography, on population size, on population density, on the way subpopulations connected with each other to make metapopulations. Stephen Shannon in UCL, for instance, suggested that very small populations are, are vulnerable to loss of culture through just by the loss of the individuals who carry certain cultural knowledge. So if there's only a thousand of you and there's only 10 people know how to make fishing nets, it's quite likely that all 10 could die the same year and then you have a big problem. Joe Henrich produced a model in which individuals learn by copying the most competent individual in their surroundings. Now, given that individuals have different levels of skills, that creates a ratchet effect. I cop everyone copies from the most competent one. I, d I copy with errors, just like genes get reproduced with errors. And then selection takes place and the new versions, which are most effective, get retained and the old ones die. Now, obviously, the larger the population, the bigger the variety and the more chance there is that I'm going to uh, find a useful variant to copy and I can actually improve on the original. So according to Joe Henry, uh, who wrote a wonderful book called The Secret of Our Success, um, the larger the population, the more variety and the more complex skills we manage to evolve. Another person called Adam Powell produced a model showing how structured metapopulations, where there's a lot of links between groups, uh, culture spreads faster and emerges, emerges more rapidly. And he tries to show that uh, empirically, though his demonstration is not very good, that certain factors of modern culture emerged both in Africa and in Europe only when populations reached a certain critical density. That's a concept I'm going to come back to in a minute. Now, I claim to be a scientist, and you know, all of us scientists, we have a not invented here syndrome. So uh, I read all these models. I thought they were plausible and well-written and pretty convincing. But of course, no one's happy with using other people's models. So I wanted to develop one of my own. And by pure coincidence, I happened to know a little bit of epidemiology. So I thought, can we apply epidemiology to the evolution of culture? Now, as we all sadly know today, disease spreads through social contacts. So I thought I could apply the same idea to cultural innovation. In other words, I could treat the spread of cultural innovation as being analogous to the spread of a disease. And I could treat the way in which an innovation becomes endemic in a population, it gets stabilized, as analogous to the way a disease can become endemic in a population, like for instance, HIV today. Now, once I'd made that analogy, I could use the mathematics of epidemiology. Now, today we've all become epidemiologists, and we know that in a well-mixed population, the spread of an infection depends on the number of secondary infections created by each index case. This is the famous R0. If R0 is greater than one, the infection spreads. If it's lower than one, it will die out. Now R0 depends on the numer number of opportunities there are for one person to give the infection to another person. And this in turn depends on the social network to which this person depends. Now, social contacts are a function of population density. If you live in London, you're going to have more social contacts than if you live in the Kalahari Desert. It follows that if there's a critical density for an infection to spread, uh, it will only spread when population density crosses a critical value. 
Now, I thought maybe we could apply this same idea to cultural innovation. An innovation will only, sp will only spread if the population is dense enough. And so I tried to test this idea. I, I built an agent-based model, which I'm not going to show you here. I'm not very proud of it. And I showed that, yes, at least in principle, this could be true. But then I ran up against a problem. I wanted to, I needed to operationalize my model and test it. But I had not the least idea how to do that. And worse, when I reread the papers I was citing a few minutes ago, I found they didn't know how to do it uh, either. Yes, the, there were a few papers in the literature which suggest, which, with some empirical evidence, uh, that cultural complexity is related to population size or population density or population connectedness. There were some others, several, which tried to find a link and completely failed. But even when I was in a really optimistic mood, I couldn't pretend that these models or mine had much empirical support. So all this was a nice hobby until 2016 when I was doing my normal reading and I found a paper by a man called Alex Timmerman. What did Timmerman, what did Timmerman do? He is not an anthropologist at all. Uh, he is a climate modeler. And he used well-established climate models to estimate the net primary productivity of different areas of the globe. He divided the globe into hex hectagons, 100 kilometers radius each. Over, and he did this over the last 120,000 years. So wherever you were uh, on the globe, he could tell you uh, what the net, how much vegetation there was at any time over the last 120,000 years. Now, using simple regression models, he's, he knows that uh, maximum population density, the carrying capacity, is linked to net primary productivity. So he knew for every part of the globe how many humans that part of the globe could carry. Then he grafted onto the climate model a human dispersion model. So he started off uh, in a few places in Africa, randomly seeded, and he allowed humans to grow at a very slow exponential rate until until they reached the maximum carrying capacity, then they would disperse randomly into the adjacent cell and the whole process would start again. He Monte carlo this, repeated it many, many times and found which were the most likely scenarios. He then verified this against arrival times in different continents and found that the best scenarios worked very well indeed. So, I wrote to Timmerman and I asked him for his data and uh, he was very nice. He sent it absolutely, he sent it the same day. And I did some exploratory studies trying to model uh, the start of agriculture. But I didn't yet have a really good testing methodology. I did a few figures, some of them looked nice, but it wasn't very convincing. But I started talking to other anthropologists and seeing what we could do. And Stephen Shannon, who I cited earlier, invited me to London. And I met some of the authors of the demographic models I was talking about. So, during the meeting, someone suggested that a, a good way of testing my hypotheses would be to talk about rock art, which has been about around for the last 50,000 years. Actually, the oldest bit we have is 77,000 years old. And it's present in just about every corner of the globe. During the same meeting, I was also introduced to Anders Ericsson, who had also written a paper, which I didn't know about, making his own estimates of world population, which I think is actually better than Timmerman's paper. And he was also a much better mathematician and methodologist than I am. So very quickly, uh, we started a, co a collaboration and he became my, my co-author. And so the research proceeded in three directions, model building, data collection, and verification. So, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, next. So, 
On the model building side, I forgot about agents. It was too complicated. And I adopted a classical SIA model, SIR model. And I got help from mathematicians at Bluebrain to formalize it, because I'm not a really good mathematician. So in the model, let's consider what I call a culturally effective population. I mean a, net, a meta population, a network of connected subpopulations who are regularly in contact, <coughs> exchanging cultural innovations. A certain proportion of these subpopulations are infected. In terms of the model, that means they have the innovation. A certain proportion are susceptible. That means they don't have the innovation. Now, we just for convenience sake, oh, oh yeah, let's, we talk about proportions. So we say a, uh, a certain proportion of the population is infected, a certain proportion of the population is susceptible. We can then work out how the proportion of infected increases over time. And we see that this is governed by two parameters, beta, which is the rate of transmission between from infected to susceptibles, and gamma, which is the rate at which infected people are removed from the population. That means in our, in our, in our setting that an infected community loses the skill, maybe because the person, maybe because the, the community is wiped out, maybe because the person with the skill dies and he's not replaced. Um, so we carry on. Now, I can show in the paper, which I'll give you a reference to at the end, that in this model, there's a critical level of population density, which is necessary for the innovation to spread. So I can write the number of subpopulations or the proportion of subpopulations with the innovation as this. If density, that's shown by rho here, is below the critical density, there are none. If it, uh, if it is greater than the, than the threshold, the, num the proportion of infected populations increases in a way which is a bit like a linear increase, though it's not actually linear. Now, that's great, except that there's no way we can actually observe, uh, observe the proportion of infected populations, subpopulations in a whole population. That's not given. We don't know how the population is even divided into subpopulations. But what we can do is look at whether rock art is uh, present in a certain geographical area. So from the model, we deduce a probability of finding rock art in an area with a particular population density, which is given by the formula you see here, where the zeta represents a, a very small constant, which is related to the possibility that any area, that, that any um, population with rock art will actually succeed in leaving it behind them. There's many things which, on which this depends. It may be geology, there's maybe no good cave. It may be climate. If you're in the tropics, your rock art will probably deteriorate and there'll be nothing left for archeologists to find. It may be research efforts. Some parts of the world, like think Central Africa, have just not been explored by archeologists. So it's various things. Anyway, we can deduce from our model the probability of rock art being found in any one part of the globe. So that's the model. Let's carry on. The second strand in our work was data collection. Uh, we did a systematic survey of the rock art literature, looking for rock art sites. It's a job I recommend to nobody. I recommend you get lots of PhD students to do this. It's a horrible job. The data is dirty beyond belief. Um, people don't use the same units. Some people tell you what the, what the date is today. Some people talk about dates BP, which is a radiocarbon dating terminology. Some talk about dates since 2000. 2000. They use different dating methods, which are not always compatible. Um, some dates are controversial. Sometimes you get two sites being called by the same name. No one reports longitude and latitude and so on. We spent a lot of time 
creating this data set, which we're quite proud of now, though I'm pretty confident it almost certainly still includes some errors. Um, we got, in the end, we got 133 sites all over the world. And we, we located each one of them. And so we were able to compute. Oh, wait a minute, sorry, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, you notice some of the sites are very concentrated in some places. Uh, we have a lot of sites in Australia, a lot of sites in Western Europe, particularly France and Spain, quite a few in Southern Africa. Elsewhere, the density of sites is much less. And this is a potential source of bias. We also have uh, bias in age. Uh, most, a, a huge majority of our sites are less than 10,000 years old. The very old sites are also very rare. But when we did a very preliminary analysis of uh, our sites, we found something interesting. We divide, you remember that our model of population was divided into hexagons. We found that the distribution of population, uh, that if I, if I count the number of hexagons with a certain population density, in globals, that means in, in places where, where in all the hexagons on the model, there's a lot of very poorly populated places and a few tightly highly populated ones. That's the mauve uh, bump at the end of the graph. In the rock art samples, there's very, very few uh, low, poorly populated places and they're all in highly populated places. Now that doesn't prove our models correct. It doesn't prove anything, but it was a good reason to carry on. It, uh, it encouraged us. So we also needed to develop a good methodology for our investigation. So for various reasons I won't go into, we decided to use uh, my co-author's population data, not Timmermans. And we decided to use a Bayesian approach to looking at the, um, to, to trying to test our model. So first of all, we calculated, uh, we divided our, all the cells in our map into uh, bins and we calculated the probability that a cell with a given, with a population, a certain bin, contained a rock art cell. So we then looked at those, the probability, we could compare that against the probabilities estimated by our model with different parameter values. Uh, we scanned through all the possible, fortunately it's a model with very few parameters, through, through all, the, but we brute forced it, we looked at all the possible parameter values, we chose the most likely ones, calculated their posterior distributions. And then we looked at how likely was our model compared to two other models. A null model in which the, the probability of having a rock art site was completely independent of population. It was constant across all population bins. And a proportional model where it was linearly proportional to the size of the population. Uh, that was answering a model proposed by a man called Kramer, which was elsewhere in the literature. We won't go into that now. So what did we find? We found the fit you see on this slide. Uh, population density, at low, where there is low population density, we found very few rock art sites. And when population density increased, that's on the x-axis, we found the probability of finding a rock art site increased enormously. And where the inflection point in that curve we find is reasonably well constrained. It's about, you start finding rock art sites where there are approximately 12 point something individuals per 100 square kilometers. Now, as a scientist, I like making my own models. And of course, I, I really believe they're the best models in the world, but I'm also trained that I'm meant to be distrustful of my results. So before publishing this, we did an awful lot of verification. Now, I'll, I'll go through some of the things we did. First of all, if you look at the graph, 
you will see that on the left hand side uh, there aren't exactly zero sites in the low population bins. There's very few, but there is not zero. And that formally contradicts the prediction of the model. But we knew that our rock art sites had lots of, were the, the papers we were taking the rock art sites from used lots of different ways of estimating uh, age. Some use so-called direct methods. That means you take a sample from the pigment on a painting and you do uranium thorium testing or you do radiocarbon testing or you do optical luminescence testing, you get an age. That gives you an exact age. Some, they did the same thing, but on remains found next to the painting, like bones. That does not give you an, act, an exact age. <clears throat> the bone could be much more recent or much older than the painting. Some looked at the rock behind the painting, or the, sometimes we, we had engravings as well, and got an age from that, but that gives you a maximum age. It can't be older than the rock. Some looked on glaze which had formed above the painting. That gives you a minimum age. In other words, <coughs> our ages were comparing uh, apples and lemons. Uh, and some used calibrated ages. That's uh, when we do radiocarbon dating, we need to calibrate the dates. Some didn't. So there was lots of differences. What did we do? We found all the papers where for one reason or another, we suspected that we were suspicious of the dates. They weren't exact direct dates. We eliminated them. So instead of having, I don't have the number here, I, we got it down to about 50, 50 sites instead of 133. There, all the sites had population densities above our critical threshold. Absolutely no exceptions. And the fit of the model was much better than an original model. So it seemed that these little errors we were finding were possibly just noise in the data. When we compared our model to other models, we were 10 to the 29th better than a, um, a, a null model, complete independence between demography and, uh, and frequency of sites. And we were about 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th times better than a model which was proportional. So we thought, this was pretty strong empirical support for the model. But of course, that uh, noisy dates wasn't the only thing which could have been wrong. I said earlier on, I'm going back to an earlier slide, that uh, we have geographical bias in our sample. There's way too many sites in Australia, way too many sites in UK and uh, not UK, sorry, that's false, in Spain and France. And also there's way too many sites are recent. So it's not, the sites are not evenly distributed across by age. And this is actually, the age distribution is probably just because older sites have tend to be destroyed. The uh, geographical distribution may be because, uh, because there are no sites there. You'll notice there are no sites or practically no sites in this band of equatorial regions, uh, but it may also be due to bi research bias. Most archaeologists go to places where it's nice to be on holiday. So you go to Spain, you go to, you go to Italy, you go to France. It's, it's lovely. You, you can dig, you can find your remains, and it's a nice place to be. There's very good food. You don't do, go to the Central African desert to do, uh, Central African jungle to do that. It's just not a good idea. Um, so, we were worried there could be bias in our data. What did we do? We repeated our analysis for different subgroups of sites. We looked at all the sites in the French Spain area. We looked at all the sites in Australia. We looked at all sites which were more recent than 10,000 years. We looked at all sites which were less recent than 10,000 years. And in each case, we found exactly the same tendencies. We always found a critical date, a critical uh, population density above which, uh, above which um, the frequency of sites rose dramatically and below which there were no sites. Uh, we always found that our model fitted the, uh, fitted the, um, the data much better than a null model or a proportional model. And 
And uh, so we were very happy. We also did one more thing. Remember, I started off this research inspired by a population model by Timmerman, but we carried on using data from Ericsson. Well, this data, fortunately, was covered exactly, the, it was the same units, and it gave exactly the same information. So I said, maybe this is just an artifact due to the fact we chose Ericsson's data. So we repeated our analysis using the data from Timmerman, and lo and behold, the relationship we found wasn't quite so strong, but we still had the relationship. So I think this is very strong evidence that the report, that the model is good. Finally, last control. Uh, there was an assumption built into our model that the number of social contacts someone has is proportional to the square root of, um, of population density. Um, this came from an empirical paper by a man called Grove, but it's not a strong theoretical result. In fact, there were theoretical objections to it. We tried varying the exponent, keeping a power relationship between uh, population density and um, contacts, but varying the power. We did that and we found that the model is extremely non-sensitive to that. So we had a robust model, which worked in many, many different regions, which worked with different data and input. We were totally happy. Um, so what can we conclude? The first one is, I would say, I would actually dare to say without conditionals, the null hypothesis is disproved. It, given this sort of data, at least for rock art, it's impossible to claim that the detection rates for rock art are independent of population density. And we haven't proved that our epidemiological model is correct, but yes, it does have extremely strong empirical support. A few provisos. There are many areas of the world, again, I refer to Central Africa, which in the past had very high population densities, but which today have zero rock art. So we have to be clear about what our model predicts. We do not predict that wherever there is high population density, there will be rock art. We predict that population density above a critical threshold is a necessary condition for rock art not a sufficient condition. Uh, that means that if we're really going to explain the world distribution of rock art, we're going to need other models as well, not just our own. And I would actually hazard a guess that our model is complementary to the demographic models proposed by other people. Uh, we also made a number of uh, two um, methodological innovations of which we're quite proud. Uh, the first was most existing studies talked in terms of what they call, and I call, a culturally effective population. That's, as I said at the beginning, it's a network of subpopulations which exchange information or exchange innovations. Now, I think this is absolutely valid from a theoretical point of view. The difficulty from an operational point of view is we have no way of measuring the size of a culturally effective population on if it's on a continental land block. We can, we can measure it on an island, but we don't know what were the social contacts between a population in point I and point J. So we don't know if they are part of the same culturally affected population or not. And therefore, we can't measure the size of that cultural, culturally affected population. That makes verification of models which use this concept very difficult. We use population density and now we have models like, Tim, like Timmermans or model like Ericsson's and other models have also been published. We, have, we actually have numbers for that. So we have data we can use to verify our models. The second innovation we made was in how we measure culture. Up to now, most, most empirical papers have used some sort of concept of cultural complexity. Sometimes they try and count the number of tools in the toolkit of a particular community. So, you know, how many tools do you have for uh, hunting? Uh, this is a methodology developed by, by Oswald in the 70s and 80s. Or sometimes they look at the complexity of individual tools, like how many different bits and parts does a tool have? 
But again, in an archaeological context, this is extremely unpractical because if I dig up the remains of an ancient culture, particularly if it's really in Paleolithic times, I only have a tiny sample of the culture. I just don't know how many tools they had. I find some stone tools maybe because that's what's well preserved, but I have no idea how many other tools they have. So that's very hard to measure. We take a much simpler measure. It's in a given place, did I find an example of a particular class of artifact? That's all. And that is much simpler to measure. And it's not limited to one particular kind of artifact. It's, you can use it to any artifact. And in fact, this is the direction in which I'd like to take this work in the future. Just the other day, I was reading randomly and I found this in a journal called Cliodynamics. A man called Edward Turner has produced a large database of sites where anvils have been found for beating iron all across Africa and Asia, Eurasia. So maybe, I'm not certain I'm going to do this, but it would be great to be able to use these to do exactly the same analysis we did for rock art sites for iron technology. That would be a cool idea. So I'm coming to an end. What does all this mean with respect to my initial question? I said I was interested in the, hum the origins of the human exception. As I said then uh, at the beginning, most uh, anthropologists, uh, most, uh, most psychologists believe this is something to do with our neurobiology, with our big brains. But can I suggest a slightly different hypothesis? I would argue that our big brains are not a result of, are not, are not a cause of our wonderful culture, they're a result. Actually, I'm, I'd suggest that our culture is the result of the very special characteristics of human populations. We have some evidence that at least for the last two million years, human cultures, human populations have been much denser and better connected than the populations mm. of other primates like chimpanzees or orangutans. When chimpanzees, who are very intelligent, when the males meet males from another group, they fight often to the death. So the result is very, very little contact between chimpanzee groups. Genetically, if you look at two chimpanzee groups on opposite sides of a river, they're more genetically div diverse than human, than Aborigines in Australia and humans in New York. And if they don't transmit genes, they probably don't transmit cultural innovations either. Now, human males also fight. We know that. They don't do it quite so often, even in academia. So different groups, even in academia, transmit their innovations to each other. And the innovations stay around, even when the groups are gone. They go endemic. They become building blocks for future innovations. And this, I, th this, I think a lot of people would agree, is the process which gave us human language, human technology, human hunting techniques and so forth. And precisely these technologies allowed us to build bigger, even better connected populations, starting a, a virtuous circle of cumulative cultural evolution. In brief, the proximal cause of the human ex exception, I would argue, is cumulative cultural evolution. And that's not a very controversial claim, but the distal cause is basically humans' ability to get along with each other which makes it rather curious that so many politicians would like us not to get along with each other. Now, one final conjecture before I take questions. I said that in the traditional story, it's our big brains that gave us the culture. I think it's much more likely. It's our culture that gave us big brains. In terms of genetics and neurobiology, uh, great ape, all the great apes are incredibly similar to humans. And our last common ancestor was only 7 million years ago. If evolution could create humans in that time, it could also have allowed other apes to grow large brains, if that had been advantageous. But it wasn't. I'd suggest that's because the other apes didn't need them. We began to need big brains 
when we became a cultural animal, when we had to learn language and hunting and morals and politics and differential calculus, then you need big brains. To sum up, what I'm arguing is that it was human population size and structure and niceness that gave us culture and culture gave us big brains, not the other way around. That's, I think, enough for the moment. Here is a reference to our preprint. The, uh, the actual journal article is currently under review and it's been under review forever. It's a very slow process, but hopefully it will be published in a peer reviewed journal very, sh very soon. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to try and answer them. Thank you. Yeah, first, let me thank you, Richard, for this brilliant exposition. I really think this is, from a scientific point of view, a very important work. Uh, it's one of the rare cases where I think this type of work also has or allows direct conclusions on how we should behave and what we should do uh, in our present time. So I think there will, I mean, I have a number of questions, but uh, I think there will be other ones. So I must say that I hope that Alessandra now can take uh, questions because I'm not the host here. Alessandra, can you somehow, or just unmute and speak? That's probably, we are not that many people, so it's probably the easiest way to do. Yes, Hi, of course. Ma Matthew Diamond here. Can I jump yep. in or should I wait? Yeah, please. No, please, oh, Matthew. Hi. Yes, Matthew Diamond from CISA, Trieste, Italy here. Uh, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, and one question that came to mind is um, in the December, in the, uh, in, 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 as to the geography of, of uh, rock art is whether the presence of rocks themselves makes a difference. Um, for instance, I, w when I have a mental image of Amazonia, I don't see any rocks. I don't, uh, they may be there, but I don't, but in all the pictures in National Geographic. Hello, I've lost you. See very many rocks. Does that figure into the presence yes, of rock art or not? Of course it does, yes. Uh, no rocks, no, no rock art, but there's mm -hmm. rocks in some amazing places. They have found rock art in the Amazon, Amazon mm -hmm. actually, under the trees there are rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a place called Pedra Pintada in Brazil, for instance. Um, they found rock art in the Sahara, also in places. Hello? Yes, Something... yes, I'm here. Oh, I'm here. oh, hang on. My headphones have died. One second. I can hear you. Can you still hear me? I'm speaking through my computer. Yeah, yeah we can we hear you. The battery died. Um, so yeah, but rocks are essential. You sometimes you engrave on the rock, sometimes you paint on it. But yes, it's an essential ingredient, and that's built into my magic um, small constant for the probability of finding finding rock art in a place. Is the geology suitable? It also has to be suitable for preserving it. Rocks on the surface are usually not much good. It needs to be somewhere where it's protected, and where the weather isn't too bad. Right. Okay. Thanks very much. I'll. Uh... Turn off my video now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. This is Harold Fellerman from Newcastle University. Hi. Absolutely fascinating. So um, you, you definitely taught me that it was a big personal mistake to not have hear a talk from you since the end of the PACE project some 15 <laughs> years ago. And I'm very happy that I managed to participate in that. Um, so if I understand you correctly, your premise or your, your, your theory is that we have this epidemi epidemiological model of, um, of cultural innovations from which they would follow that there's a critical threshold similar to R0. And you use all the evidence from rock art to, to show that, yeah, in fact, we find that there's this critical threshold. Correct. So you can find Correct. evidence for, for the consequence of your of your theory that comes out of your theory, but what do you think there are alternative theories that could also lead to this threshold but suggest a completely different way of cultural evolution? So there are, I wouldn't call all the models alternative, 
So there's been various modeling model, models built about the role of culture, and I think they're probably all valid. I see them as being complementary. Each explains some particular function. Now, non, the, the trouble with non-demographic, of course, we like demographics, it's sort of measurable. Um, you do read stuff, qualitative stuff by anthropologists, but it's exceedingly verbal. And I have deep difficulties in extracting even the vaguest predictions from it. So, yeah, sure. So rock art is linked to shamanism, this sort of thing. But what I can predict, I don't know. So I think if we want a causal account, I think demography is, and is definitely a part of it. But no, my model isn't ex exclusive. I think there are several models. And there may be future models which do also do a very good job. A second question I had in mind, if I can just um, add to it. Um, it's, it's more a question about opinion. And, and so do you think that um, increased population is always beneficial for cultural evolution? Or is there a sweet spot? So <laughs> it's come from... <laughs> is uh, this, um, on, the, on the edge of chaos, for example. <laughs> sweet spots. Uh, so so trying... I th looking at the model, um, there is no sweet spot. The number of innovations go once you're past, once you're past the uh, past the um, critical threshold, it goes up and up and up until you reach saturation. This is a model about probabilities, so at a certain point, the probability becomes one, and then it's then it saturates. But I think this also matches the historical evidence. Most of the uh, big historical innovations, whatever period you look at, have happened in dense populations. I think of the emergence of agriculture in the Middle East. I think of also the emergence of industry, both simult simultaneously in, um, in Britain and continental Europe and simultaneously in China and in India in the 17th century. These are all den pretty dense urban populations. We, this is where we've also developed writing. So I, I tend to think that more density is good for you. But I, so you that's not a rigorous statement, but at least within the confines of my model, that's the way it seems to be. Um, the model actually says something else I didn't mention in the talk, which is the more complex the uh, innovation, the more the harder it is to transmit, that is in disease terms, the lower its infectivity, the denser the population you need. So very complex things need big, dense populations. Very simple things can go even in less dense populations. And that's true for disease too. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you, Richard. Thank you. I have, I have also a question, if you, if you permit. Um, well, you, you discussed, uh, you just mentioned the problems of, let's say, data. Uh, what about police reports nowadays? Uh, what I'm heading at is, have, do you think that your model is applicable to, let's say, graffiti, street art in the sense, in that sense? Uh, and and my, 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 my idea was here that maybe uh, you, when we have police reports, we know quite precise, I, I think, or I, I assume that we know qu quite precisely how graffiti uh, spread and we may see even a big difference in the, let's say, pre-cell phone and cell phone uh, time. Uh, I think in the pre-cell phone time where it was difficult to spread a photo, um, your epidemiological model may show, let's say, more spatial, uh, spatial uh, let's happening. say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think you, if you take your street art example, uh, yeah. you'd have two routes of infection. One mm -hmm. is, I had a son who was very keen on doing illegal things when he was a bit younger. Mm -hmm. uh, one is by imitation among gangs, gangs, groups, yeah. teams of young boys who like imitating each other. So you imitate what's done on the street next door, or you try and do better. You, t you do a yeah. better tag than they do. Yeah. So that's direct physical contact. And then, of course, there's the, there's the route which you're saying which is via, via uh, electronic transmission. And that yeah. can even be global. You can, you, 
people in Beijing can copy what's going on in what's going on in, in Chicago. And you could look at the maybe in your pre cell phone age, you could find a that street, this street art is way more common where populations are dense. I think that's almost trivial. I think mm -hmm. we know that it's a big city phenomenon. But also you might find that where communication between zones is poor, you get relatively little copying. And where communication is good, you get more. I'd hypothesize that. On the uh, more global front, you'd have to look at what the global uh, network connections within the social media are. That I'd, I don't know, but I'd suspect that there is a link. Unless the transmission is just so global, it just saturates. Mm -hmm. And that would, of course, uh, 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 apply to other beneficial and nasty behaviors too. Well, think about the spread of sort of particular political ideas like anti-vaccination sentiment. That also, I think, follows, uh, it's an infection which spreads and it doesn't respond to antibiotics. It, that's true. However, I think with respect to political opinions, this is somewhat, I, I would argue that this is maybe a sort of a different type of infection because, um, you know, it's, it's actually quite cheap uh, to yeah. adhere to, let's say, idiotic ideas. Whereas um, doing graffiti, doing, yeah, that requires certain skill. It's a little bit dangerous. You really, you have to pay for it. Yeah, I agree. So its infectivity is lower. So you mm -hmm. need a denser, a denser population to do it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or any, anyone would like to start doing this and on some completely different data set? We have software, we can give you the software. The software is on GitHub, by the way, anyone can download it. Ah. It's written in execrable Python, but it's, so it works. Well, actually, I, I, have an, I have another question, you, which is somewhat more technical, so to speak. Uh, you said uh, that, uh, you have to take into account that uh, sites may decay due to car climate, they may be lost for whatever reasons. Uh, what happens to your model if you include sort of a, uh, let's say, a decay term? And this can be a sort of a linear decay term, which is probably not a very good thing, but it also could, uh, let's say, reflect age, an aging process uh, via some power law, something like that, which would account for the fact that you have uh, less, uh, less um, very old sites than you may have, th then you have newer sites. But where I, I don't quite know where we would seed it from for your initial state. Like mm. where, how would I seed it with the situation, let's say 50,000 years ago? Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, you just don't have the data, fair point. So yeah. we, do, we don't have data for places we don't see. All we see um, are, the ones, are the survivors. Um, fair point. Deep survivor, survivor, survivor bias in the, da in the data. Absolutely, I am, fair point. Are there further questions? That seems not to be the case. Then let me thank the speaker again. This was, as always, very inspiring. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you all you of you for being here. Now I'm on holiday. Ah, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> now you take, now you take the drinks with the little, with the little umbrellas and <laughs> very good. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And Richard, I really would enjoy to discuss issues as soon as you return from holiday. I really would like to. Well, we can uh, discuss dis epidemiology even this weekend. I'm not, I'm okay. not on holiday to discuss that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow I'm I'm booked, but maybe on uh, maybe on Saturday if you have time. On some. Yeah. Sunday. Uh, Sunday. So, so, so Sunday. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So I will leave you all and enjoy your weekends, please, everybody. Thank you very much. Wear a mask, please. Yeah, we do. Actually, it seems to be important. Yeah. Alessandra and the Kurdis, thanks for organizing the seminar. That's yeah, amazing. Alessandra, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, 
tutta la contingente in Venezia. Yeah, and I hope to see you all next Friday. Yes. Okay. Bye, thank bye. you. Bye bye. bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. So, Alessandra? I yes. Still here. Yes, how many people here. did we? How many people did we have? I think uh, something 12. about twelve. Twelve. Ah, that's 12. good. Oh, yes. that's oh, that's very good. Yeah, that's yes. very good. Very yes. nice. To be uh, the thirty-one of July, it's very good. <laughs> yeah, By absolutely. Way, Alexander, if anyone wants to ask me, I have no problem about sharing. What? Sorry. If anyone wants the slides, I have no problem about sharing. Ah, uh, yes, please. Uh, if you can uh, send the slides, that will be great. It will be great. Yes.